Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, it was nice seeing all those pictures. I'm glad to see everybody got home from their experience there. All us East Coasters who came home to do nothing but shovel snow for 12 hours or what it felt like 12 hours. I didn't. I missed that. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> Some people's flights got canceled. <laughs> Some people hung out in the Florida sun for an extra 24 hours. I know. I, I saw pics of that too, which you can't beat that either. Well, everybody, for if you weren't there, last week was ATIA. It actually was in person. It was a it was a hybrid event. And I'm looking, and I think a large chunk of us were there, uh, which is exciting. It was it was uh fun. And I'm I'm game for a little recap if people want to give like a, you know, your your top two things, top three things that you either saw or did or reflections of the day of the days. I am uh game time. I think we would love to hear it. I'm sure there's great stuff to share. Or not. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll share. I'm Hi, Natalie man. Newman from um, Bellingham, Washington. So I would say good morning to you all of, on morning. the East Coast because it's morning for me. Um, this was my first visit to ATIA. And so, and people have asked, you know, people that I've knew I was going said, Oh, you know, how was the conference? And I said, it was great. And I said, I don't really have anything to compare it to because, um, Mike, I think when I was in your, your session, you'd mentioned that the attendant, the registration attendance was quite low yeah. compared to other years, but I have nothing to compare that to with it being my first year. But, um, so it was, it was great. You know, I, it was great. All the information I got was, was wonderful. It's, it's overwhelming, you know, sometimes to get a little bit of everything, you know, like my brain was just so exhausted every day, but it was so energizing to be with people face to face, you know, and talking, sharing ideas and collaborating and, and just gaining insights and offering insights. Um, in person, it was just like, that's just so energizing. And it just really hits home how important, that, how important that is you. It's great to connect online, but there's still something missing. And when you can connect in person, it just, it makes it all the more. And in fact, like I'm here, like I'm here, I've known about the AT town hall for a while now, but because I connected with people about it in person, it's like, oh yeah, well now I can further make, make that connection, you know, online. So so I, I, that's, that was my top takeaway, I guess, was just kind of having a breath of fresh air, some greater inspiration, that encouragement to kind of keep doing the work, you know? So yeah, it was really good. Those are all good ones. I love it. I think that's great. I think that, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. I, I expected, I had this expectation of, you know, there, it, if you've ever been to ATIA in the Carib there, there's this really long hallway that connects one side of the center to the other. Uh, and that's where the Caribbean ballrooms are, right along that long hallway. And in my mind, I was afraid I would show up to the, the first day of the actual conference and it would be just kind of deserted feeling. And I was like, oh, that's gonna really stink. I think that's not, that's not gonna feel very ATIA-ish. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised that I thought it, it had a nice energy and there was a, gr a crowd and I think that felt really nice. Um, I think it ha the thing that I'll reflect on that reminded me how powerful live presentations are and live getting together um, was Kelly when we did our first day of the of the AT boot camp on Tuesday, and we let them we let them go into we let our group go into smaller groups to have a conversation, and these were groups of maybe three or four people each, right? So kind of small. Um, but you saw that real time live sharing that we miss on a platform like this, where people were in an intense conversation, but everybody was talking at once and everybody was absorbing everything else that everybody said. And then there were little side conversations all happening within that little space. And I thought, you know, that's, that's what we miss on zoom because ultimately even though we're all together whether it's here or we put each other in a in a smaller breakout room there is kind of this linear conversation that happens i'm talking so now no one else knows everyone else knows not to talk or else no one will get heard but when you're in person that all goes straight out the window and it is the best thing ever to just hear people just chatting um, and so that was really exciting 
So one of the quick takeaways is in, in our session Friday afternoon at 4.30, which is always a fun time to present, um, we actually asked how many people were here for their first ATIA, and it was almost half the room, Hillary, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe even more, um, which, I, which helped us and how we framed things. But um, that was a very pleasant surprise, and I don't know what brought about that change if, you know, if it was just a matter of coincidence and we would have had that without the pandemic or not, I don't know, but it was, it was a very pleasant surprise to have a overwhelming majority of the people in the session be, be new to ATIA. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's interesting. There's always been kind of that, that, that number of, of new people that you see kind of sprinkled into sessions. Um, I think it's interesting. I wonder what that says for us as a, as a field if I was to call assistive technology and education a field, um, is it just mean that it's been acknowledged more and maybe schools are realizing I should probably get some of my staff more experience in understanding what's out there and how to do this? I don't know. It used to be, you know, in, in non-pandemic times, <laughs> pre-pandemic, um, you would find the majority of first timers going to in-person conferences and they would be a closing the gap, mm -hmm. right? You would have, when you would ask the question, how many of you is this your first time? There would be a larger percentage of those hands in the gap sessions than there were at ATIA. Mm -hmm. And it, not that there weren't newbies at ATIA, there were, but they didn't, just didn't seem to be as plentiful. Um, and maybe this is just, this year was was a result of this was the only in person mm -hmm. national AT conference that really tackles K twelve because CSUN's in person but not a large K twelve contingency there. Yeah, that's a really good point, Kel. Just yeah. musings. Yeah, that could be right. Other thoughts from people who were there, something to take away. I think for me, because I've pivoted, but I'm still in AT, it was, it was nice to remember, we, you know, we gather in this manner, but it was so nice to get together with people in the field and have not even just in session, but outside of sessions, some really deep, meaningful conversations about not just AT, but education and individuals with disabilities and how do we work together to honor individuals with disabilities in a more authentic way with the tools and supports that we have. And I, the connections and just opening up to everybody, it, I felt like it was different. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's like the, if it's because of a COVID, like a co the COVID effect for lack of a better term. I felt like people were more vulnerable and authentic at this conference than another. Maybe it's just me and my own social anxiety. And now that I've been there a couple of times, I'm in a little better place to navigate that. But I just felt like the conversations I had felt more vulnerable, not just with myself, but with the people I was conversing with and talking about our challenges and talking about our own internal challenges and external challenges. And, and it, and maybe that's just something, but it, it, that just really helped me and just inspired me. Like, I feel like my cup, even though I'm exhausted, my cup feels so full right now because, and it's, a lot of you were there and I'm just so grateful because I think, and it, and it always goes back to joy for me. I felt her everywhere, even though she wasn't physical, I felt her ever people would tell. And it's weird because people would tell me stories about funny things that would happen with these little things. And I'm like, oh, that's joy. Let us know, you know, like keep on keeping on. And, and that just drives me to just want to just keep going and do better with, with our field and, and get other people in the field. Like our first timers in our session, Alyssa was like, yes, but you all welcomed me when I didn't have a clue. And I just want to pay that forward because it is a community. That reminded me of how deep and wonderful our community is. And that the other piece for me is that 
you know, you go to other conferences where there might be an edu celeb or somebody that has a big follower, somebody that's well known. And sometimes it's kind of like a ego match. And I don't, that's not how I roll personally. So I'm a person, I'm a human role. So that's how I feel ATIA is, is that that's not there. We're all trying to help and support each other. And, and, and especially with like what happened with that camp, that just, there was just so much of it that I'm just grateful. I can't wait to go back because it was that powerful. It was so good. Yeah. That Mike, so we, we left a group in the room chatting far after we were finished. I don't know how long they stayed. I think Kelly might've been in that group. Um, I, I, we, we, we were done and they didn't want to stop talking and we weren't going to stop the talking. Right. We'd given out prizes. We and whatever they were over there engaged in a, in a, in a, a deep and big conversation and they kept talking. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. Isn't that, isn't that what, you know, if we talk specifically about the ed camp, but in the broader sense about what Hillary said, it, it, it's this opportunity. And, and maybe that's why people felt more open Hillary. I thought it was, I thought it was interesting too. I thought I, I, I did feel different as the week went on um, because that is the first thing I've gone to in a very long time. I've gone to some things, but I'm going to call them smaller things with a small T. This is the big, biggest thing I've gone to in a long time. Um, and and it, it, it almost felt at times like we were refiguring out how to do some of these things in person. Um, I don't know how many times I said to people during the week, I am, I am relearning how to engage my presenter muscles and my participant muscles. Um, I know that when I, when I got home really late Friday night um, and my wife said, what happened to your voice? I said, it is completely blown out from talking all week. It's just, it's blown out right now too. Um, but it was really in the best possible way. Um, but it was, it was different and it was exciting different. And I think that was fun. Um, and, and I thought that that, that virtual component of it, um, if anyone was in, if you either presented to the virtual community as well, or were in one of the rooms where the virtual community was kind of happening in parallel, I found that to be really exciting. And it made me want to think harder about how to have that happen for both groups at the same time, how to have that same, how to bring those two groups together. Um, we did we did an AT chat SmackDown, Alyssa and I with Kelly suiting and um, we had a really uncomfortable plan that would have just blown up in our faces, but it would have been awesome if it even worked slightly, um, but we kind of backtracked from it at the last minute, um, but we were gonna have people in the room connected the virtual participants all through Zoom. We were gonna set up Zoom stations around the room where people could choose a breakout room virtually, but talk to the people in person. Um, and I think probably the look on the uh, AV guy's face when we told him probably said, maybe that wasn't a good idea to try. Uh, I really thought he was gonna just run away screaming. Um, but I think that had such an interesting potential. I, we had two sessions in those large streaming rooms that in addition to the people that were there, there were 300 people watching it live at the same time. And, and I got to say, Mike, oh, I'm sorry. No, I go ahead, Judy. What, what do you got? That's, that's why I hate Zoom, because there's always the potential to interrupt. But yeah, go um, ahead. I, I have to say the virtual audience was on fire. I moderated four different sessions yeah. and they were all over the place. They were contributing so much to the discussions. They were adding resources and everything. And I heard one of the speakers, um, Yanez Peterson, I wasn't, um, I didn't moderate her session. Did anybody online moderate her session? No. She had a way, and I don't remember, you know me, I'm not techie. A ask Kelly, I, I uh, am the queen of the hot mic. But anyway, um, uh, she had some sort of um, way of seeing who her Zoom audience was. And she had people from South Africa, for goodness sake. Um, so, I, and like I said, I don't know in, uh, what she used, but I did recommend to Caroline that, that they give us all a tutorial on it if they are going to have um, a virtual component so that we could do that as moderators and bring everybody in and have them see on a map where they're all from. 
but yeah. it was so as Kelly was saying in the chat box, we yeah. actually logged into the zoom in the front as well um, as the moderator. So I was in the zoom and I'm very curious because I see Cassie Frost on the call and I know she was in our session. I'm curious also about her, her feeling from her end of it, but from my end, I feel like there's a, a very valuable piece going forward, like Mike saying of, of if we find the right ways to engage them, um, there were uh, there was a very healthy chat going on that we're gonna pull and put into our session. So I'll stop talking and Cassie, I'm putting you on the spot, but I know you're up for it. Well, there we go. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> I think it depended on what session you were in. Yeah. Some presenters and the moderators were really good at monitor monitoring the chat and like bringing up the things that were being said in chat to the presenters. And in other sessions, the chat really seemed very separate. Yeah. So like people were talking in the chat, but the presenters were never aware of what was being said there. And so in that case, it felt really separate. It really didn't feel like it was worth continuing the conversation in the chat unless it was, you know, a completely separate topic that was being discussed. Um, but there were definitely some I was in where the moderators were great. You know, when the presenters asked about questions or there was a pause, the moderator would bring it up. Uh, so I think that would definitely be something for next year to train like moderators on, like when is a good time to bring that up? You know, how often do we want to be engaging with the chat, not just have it step, you know, happening separately. So uh, one of the things that happened from the moderator end is that we were told to let the presenter choose when to bring in people from virtual. So that became a presenter choice. And I had it go down a couple different ways in the sessions that I did. You know, one person was, I only want them at the end. Yeah. I don't, you know, don't interrupt us. Let us do our thing. Um, and But they also ran the room that way too, yeah. right? So that, and then I had somebody else that was, as soon as you see anything that looks like a question, flag it down. So I learned after the first session that I did, I told the people in my in the room I was moderating, if you have a question that isn't just about discussion amongst the people here virtually, put question on it, like question for a presenter. Or if or I had sometimes people would ask a question and then I would write to them on the side and say, is that something you want me to ask? You know, it, sometimes it wasn't clear as the well, moderator, right? What point. people wanted me to do with that information. But I, I was like, following whatever the presenters asked me to do. I feel like there's two things that would help with that just off the top of my head. And one of them would be like having the presenter at the beginning say, here's the time I'd like to take questions. And a lot of times they may do that in the main room, you know, to everybody, or if you're doing a virtual, but I feel like being back in person with the virtual, I feel like people probably weren't comfortable with that yet, yeah. but kind of set that norm at the beginning. So I'm going to present. You know, at, at certain times, I'm going to stop and pause and ask questions. So if in the chat you have questions, that's when I'll be taking them. You know, people in the room, same thing. Because some presenters like conversation in the room while they're talking. Other presenters, you know, pretty much want it quiet until they're ready for questions. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. and we then, just went right off the rails and, and, and buck the system completely and told our poor moderator in the beginning, sorry. Why does that not surprise me? Yeah, we, um, I mean, we gave we gave our moderator free reign. We said we said to her, Angela, you are part of the group. If something pops up, just just say it. It's fine. But I, but I think that and Mia, I promise you'll get to talk. I was like, oh, I'm not going to talk till Mia talks. Um, but I think it's interesting. I think like Kelly said, I think that there's certain presenters that have a certain way they envision that hour going, and maybe it's not a free flowing back and forth of conversation. And then there's others, I mean, I think there's others that design a, a topic around this expectation that there's nothing in here that I have that's going to let me talk for an hour, because I don't talk for an hour unless we all talk for the hour. Um, and so I think that that's a different um, setup. And, and I don't know what Kelly and Judy thought. Um, I found moderating to be really hard. I thought it was really exhausting um, because I wanted to find a balance of, of acknowledging the virtual participants as part of the session. And that was really hard um, without being kind of a pain in the butt to the speaker if you got a sense that the speaker didn't want that. 
And so there's this weird kind of push and pull that I just found to be really difficult at times. Um, and I was thrilled when I was done with my second one I had to moderate. It was the best time. It was the best moment of the whole conference. I was like, thank God I am done. Um, but go ahead, Mia, jump in. <clears throat> I actually just saw that um, Dr. Doug Lean put in the chat that she moderates chats um, as a part of her um, role as an assessment consultant, and it's a skill definitely to be developed. And I can tell you guys from um, teaching online and in person last year in a couple of classes <laughs> that it was really fun to see people um, just get a little taste of what teachers did for almost a full year and maybe yeah. still doing now. Um, so part of part of this was that um, it, like it wasn't consistent from room to room. I think right. that's number one, right? It wasn't consistent to, from room to room. Um, um, from like a, a moderator standpoint or whatever, because I went into a session with Luis Perez, who we know has, or if everybody knows him, has um, visual impairments. And I'm raising my hand because there is no mic, even though it says on the tables, use the mic or have the, and the person in the back that was moderating it, like saw me raise my hand. I actually said out loud, I'd like to ask a question because the people in the Zoom uh, were getting questions from the Zoom, which was great, but they couldn't hear me. So it, it was just a complete disconnect. And, and Luis did you know, the best that he could when he saw that I was there and then waiting for the pause. But um, that was a completely different experience than um, the other one where we were in with Murata and Kelly and Alyssa. So um, yeah, so I think that there's positives. And I think that if everybody would be on the same page, that would be super, you know, that would be like kind of helpful and maybe even just a separate training for um, people who are doing for moderators and people who are, excuse me, doing those rooms, I that might be, that might be something to consider also. I think that's a really good point, Mia. And I wonder if this is going to continue on as a component of the conference, which something tells me deep down it's going to. I think there's now going to be this constant piece that is this hybrid -y effect of virtual and live people together. Maybe there is a separate checkbox a speaker has to select to say we've we've chosen you as a as a streamed session. Do you expect this to be conversational, or just you talk, people ask questions at the end? And I'm sure there's a nicer way to say that. Um, if you couldn't sense my disdain for that kind of thing, um, but this idea of just listen to me for the first 45, and then we'll chat at the last 10 or whatever it might be, um, versus participating throughout. Because I think you're right, Mia. I think the idea um, of telling people in the room to use the microphone and then not having a mechanism to use the microphone, dare I say, is ridiculous. Um, it just doesn't make any sense, right? Unless you have a plan. And I know when Alyssa and Kelly and I did ours, our plan was one of us is the mic person, most of all, because there was only two of us and there was only two mics and there were three of us. So we had to have a bit of a plan. Um, but I think that becomes really tricky to manage as we go forward. And I, I think that it um, it is an interesting experience. And I saw people saying about the captions, that was really, um, that was troubling. I, I thought that was, especially in some of those very large rooms. And I think that there, it, I think the caption, we're at a point where you could put the, the live captions on in your presentation. And while not 100%, it is certainly better than the zero we had in most of the sessions. But wasn't it working on the app for people? Because that's what we were all it, saying in the directions. It's not working on yeah. the app. And I know Mia can so, speak to it. Yeah, but, go ahead, Mia. So. Well, I know Dr. Dr. Douglas had her hand up. So I don't want to, I'm just going to say really quickly that the app was only available for certain sessions. That's number one. It wasn't available for all sessions. Um, what was happening in the app was worse than any live captionings I've ever. And personally, I just got hearing aids this summer. So I'm only talking, this is a very, well, it's not a new experience for me because I've been losing my hearing for quite right. some time. So I, I depend on captions. However, um, the AI captioning from Google was 100% better than what was in the app on the phone. 
And the app on the phone, I really like the choice of having that. However, I was doing this the entire time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or like, you know, and, and because there were so many mistakes in it, it was really kind of hard to follow. Um, but there were, but I think the fact that, I'm so sorry, I'm Dr. Dugling, go ahead and talk and I'll, I'll finish up the, what I think should happen for next, next year. Cause I know you had your. Deal. I've just been typing it in the chat. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say that when you're having virtual events, it's important now in conceptualizing that engagement piece and the presenter style that we used to just have checkoffs as to the type of session we're providing, what level it is, whether it's going to be interactive or not, it is going to help identify up front how that engagement is going to flow. Otherwise it's hit or miss and you put it on the presenter and they get lost playing with the technology that they forget, oh, I got these people back here that I also need to check back in with. So maybe in the call for papers, for things like that, that's the best spot to have that included so that people can check off. And then the IT support can already be ready to understand that. And the other issue we're having now in the age of hybrid presentations is what if one presenter gets sick right. and the other one's not and they can't attend? Is mm -hmm. there a video that's going to be played with a pre-recorded as someone's there playing it and moderating and then adding on their slides or like how Microsoft's room was, they had the main presenters in essence, virtual, and then just somebody there in the room to facilitate. Yeah. So those are all things to think of as the forefront as planners of conferences to make sure that we capitalize on this hybrid environment because it's not going away. More people were in the virtual space than were in the rooms themselves. Yes, yes, I, when, I, when I spoke to the ATIA people, the registration was almost equal between the people who were there live and the people that were there virtually. In fact, the virtual was a few more. So you're absolutely right. Um, so, and, and I think you're right. I think that it is a whole different experience. And, and I think that um, each one of us that was there probably had an experience of, of this moment of, ooh, this is not the right kind of session for a, a hybrid audience. Um, I sat in a couple and I was like, Ooh, this is not, you know, this is not the way this should go down for someone that some of those sessions would have probably played better as a simple recorded webinar. Someone would have watched because you're right. That level of engagement, the, the desire to engage the audience in some deeper conversation, um, that is a skill. Um, and it is a choice that you make when you put that stuff together. Um, and so to think that Anybody who could speak and present a session can also do that is false. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I um, mean, I think we could easily all explain examples we've seen of that. Um, yeah, I agree. Like Hillary is saying in the chat that somehow, somewhere that needs to be filtered into what the session strands advisors do in the future to make, wow, my voice sounds really bad, to make a decision about um what goes in a in a high flex kind of session and what is an in-person session yeah. um because i think um in our case it works with you me and kelly because there was a me that i could sit at the table you two could engage and we had our moderator helping us out with the chat as well so i think all three of that like I mean, we definitely need extra hands on deck to make sure that not one group is really missing out in conversation um, and, and I think it could be, it could be done well going forward because, you know, as Dougling says, it's not going anywhere. Right, right, um, exactly. But, but I think it's about thinking through which sessions, because like Mike, I sat in a couple that were in those Caribbean rooms and I was like, eh, this is not the one I would have picked over another right. session to put in those Caribbean spaces that were high flex. Right. And so, and so you wonder, and, and I guess this is, this is a conversation for the strand managers, strand advisors, and I think it's just me and Judy that are left now um, that are our strand advisors. But I think this this will have to come up in our meetings. Um, that you know this was great, but I think that there is a a, a next level of conversation we have to have about this. Because um, you're right, Alyssa. We ended up being a team of four to present one hour. It was the three of us and our moderator acting as a team of four, 
in order to do that. Sorry, Cassie, I saw you pop on, oh, go ahead. That's fine. I was just gonna comment actually on the same thing you guys were just talking about because in your session, you had three presenters, but one presenter was really focused on the chat. Yes. And so I wonder if it'd be even possible to even when you're putting in a proposal or they're being considered, have a question of, do you have a second presenter? If this were to be a, you know, a, a dual uh, presentation that mm -hmm. can attend more to it so that you can trade off. And if not, then you need to make connection with your moderator prior to this. Yeah. You know, because I mean, if, if you're presenting with somebody else, just having the awareness that one person should be spending more time on the chat, I think would go a long way. And if you don't have somebody, you're a single presenter, then maybe that needs to be a consideration on if you should be hybrid or not. Or mm -hmm. you need to commit to taking a half hour with your moderator at some point prior to the day of. Yeah. Um, just because I will say definitely the sessions that I was in where there were more presenters there was definitely a lot more attention on the chat. Yeah, for sure. I mean, moderators like we, did what they could, bandwidth. but they didn't know the content. They didn't yeah. know what was coming next. They didn't know where the presenters were necessarily going with it. Yeah. So while the moderators were awesome at monitoring the chat, asking questions when they could, they didn't have the same interaction with the chat that the presenters did. Yeah, and, and it's interesting if you think about this idea of, and I agree a thousand percent with everything you just said, Cassie, I think you're right. I think the more people you had attending to it, the more of a flow it seemed to have, which I think helped. I think this idea of the moderator and the presenters is a really tricky one. Um, and, and maybe Judy has an opinion about this too. Um, I moderated two sessions um, and I don't know if my presenters were... Ooh, this is going to seem weird. Am I going to say it? Yeah, let's, what the hell? Um, I was debating on whether to say it or not, but I'm going to anyway, why not? And I'm recording, what the heck? Um, I don't know that my presenters wanted to hear from me in a way that would have impacted their session. You know what I mean? I, I think that there's a moment where it, they were like, well, look, I'm going to present and you're just going to be over there doing that thing and never shall the two intertwine. Um, so yeah, I think it would be great. Um, I think, and I'm just envisioning, and I don't know for sure, but I'm envisioning if I had said to my speakers, Hey, I'd like to get together for a half hour to chat about how I'm going to moderate your session. Um, yeah, I don't know if that would have went over at all, but I get that, what you're saying now. And that may be where it needs to be in the yeah. beginning. Are you willing to do a hybrid session? Right. If so, here's the requirement and that on the checkbox before you ever put your proposal in yeah, um, and that'll help ATA also determine then which ones maybe should be hybrid because if they're hesitant, it might be better to just not do it hybrid well, and yeah. some presenters are more comfortable that way. Exactly. But yeah, I think you're right. Dr. Ling put in a great point. It goes, and this is a great point, Dr. Ling, it, it goes back to if they want either that choice that if they want either the interactive session or a presentation, because right. yeah. you know, like as, as you're submitting, you're going to know if you're assume if, like if I feel comfortable enough to present in both, I'm going to check that off. Yeah. And then if I'm co-presenting, which probably will, we can work that out where we could co, you know, we can literally set it up where someone's moderating, but then we can swap if we need to, if you've got more than one where you're trading off and saying, okay, now, now we're going to swap because this person's actually in this part of the presentation. Now I'm going to go moderate the chat. So then you have an overall ATA moderator, which is kind of like, the tech support, the overall making sure stuff doesn't break down. But then if you're willing to do that and say, I feel comfortable having a hybridized, you know, in-person and virtual component to my session, then I, that means that I will also have Zoom open where I'm going to monitor the chat more because like, you're right. Good point. I know my content, Yeah. but I do know there was someone that did a really good job in inserting those questions because I think they might've had those conversations ahead of time before mm -hmm. the session started or the session was structured in such a way that it just allowed for that form. But I think making that clear in submitting the proposals is gonna, I think is gonna help. But then we share the load because in a virtual, think about it in a real time setting, or if we are presenting virtual and we're co-presenting, there's someone that's moderating the chat. Mm -hmm. If I'm co-presenting with somebody, there's an overall session facility. Like when I think about CAST and their symposium, they do a phenomenal job virtually and they have room moderators. 
room moderators that will set out your breakouts, you know, preload your polls, yada, yada, yada. But when it comes to the actual like presenting part, if there's a co-presenter, we'll tell them, hey, I'll co-moderate the chat with you, which means I'm gonna infuse when I and, and point out questions too. So that's when it becomes more relational and it's been fine. It has not been an issue. So I'm wondering if there's a way to replicate that for ATIA and put that in the session proposal because it's more hybrid and not just strictly remote. Yeah. I think that's really good. I think there also could be a, a track of sessions that don't happen live streamed, but instead simply get recorded that I can watch as part of my virtual package. You know, that same kind of way they were doing it in the room, but it's not going out to the web live. And then I just watch it. And I think there is a component of that as well. Um, Oh, Mia, I see you dropping a bunch of stuff, bunch of knowledge in the in the chat there, but I, I can't even see what you said, but I bet it's fantastic. Um, Before we switch topics, I just wanted to say really quickly that I noticed Judith had said in the chat that there is a checkbox um, in the proposals. And I think that's also something to be aware of because it's easy now to say mm -hmm. in retrospect what could have been done. But I do think it's back to that really... Um, thing that we need to give everybody grace that this was the first big conference in person where this was being done yeah. and I think a lot of our presenters may have just gotten kind of blindsided by it like they thought they were ready and now mm -hmm. we're in person again and for some of these people it might be the first time they've presented in person in a very long time and so trying to do that the first time can also just be glitchy because of that I agree. I, I think for for the for the willingness to try that, it was awesome. I think the idea of bridging those two audiences together is fantastic. And I think it is great. And I think you're right, Cassie. I think there's there's a component in any of us in here who do a lot of presentations. Someone says, Will you be able to do this? If you're ready to present, you're like, sure, yeah, I can do that. Great. Yeah. No thought. Well, maybe that's just me. No thought, no planning. Just sure, I'll do that. That sounds great. Um but I think now you're right, this experience happened. I'm curious what the overall thought of a lot of the people was, not just the people who did the virtual um, hybrid streaming, but just in general, people that got back to presenting for the first time in person. Um, what what have you, what do you need to learn again? What you know, I, I spend a lot of time lately thinking about things I need to do better um, now because I was in person again. And I'm like, oh. That was my whole flight home. I was thinking about that. I'm like, oh, these are things that I know at one point I did fairly seamlessly and boy, I don't do them seamlessly anymore. And so that, that idea of thinking about what those look like um, and how to be better. Um, so I think, I think you're right, Cassie. I think it was a really great um, first step. And hey, to be honest, being there in person trumped everything. I was like, this was awesome. I was great. That just, was awesome. just keep rubbing it in, Mike. Hey, you were in CEC. You were you were down there too. <laughs> Cassie, uh, since you got your mic on, CEC was all in person, right? There was no virtual component. Uh, CEC actually had both. So there was oh, yeah, an okay. in-person last week and their virtual is this week. Oh, so they did it that way. Oh, that's and interesting. And a week too. gap in between. Oh, wait. go ahead, Dr. Go ahead. Yeah. So AOTA did a, they have a mini conference, their specialty conferences, and it was the strangest thing ever. And <laughs> It was pre-recorded, but people were sitting in a room watching a video. So I was a vendor and as I walk in, I'm like, oh, the session's starting. And I run in the room and I'm like, where's the presenter? Like I'm hearing people, but I'm not seeing people. So then for the big one that they're having in Texas in April, I asked, okay, is it going to be the same? And they said, no, but you have to pre-record. So I have recordings today. That's why I had to put my face and my everything on today. But <laughs> I have pre-recording at 2.30 to 4 o'clock. But in the room, when I go to present, they're not going to do that strange play to video when you're hanging out in the chat or there in person and waiting to answer questions. Instead, I have to give a whole new presentation. Yeah. We basically awesome. have to present twice you for present AMTN. present twice. Yeah. We have yeah. to record <laughs> ahead of time then they watch it, but they're not involved at all in the presentation that happens the day of. And we represent again to the people in front of us. And they told us blatantly on the speaker prep sessions, if you change your outline, if you change your hand, that's no big deal. So basically it's, it, it's two Different. presentations in one. Yeah. And if you want, you can moderate your chat. So I'm like, so yeah. they're just going to watch and like have nobody. So 
I'm going to have my several devices up and still yeah. talking to them as I'm talking because they pay for conference and I really think they need to be a part and, and someone needs to monitor and watch that. Yeah. And, and but, but I think that's such a good point. I mean, they paid for a conference, not a webinar, right? And I think those two things are different. If you said to me, do you want to go to a conference? In my expectation, it is interaction with others in real time about something we're talking about. That's me in my old school kind of approach to what a conference is versus a webinar. I recognize that I'm going to get some kind of uh, less participation on my end, more listening on my end, typically. Um, and, and so it's weird. And I, I would not feel good about showing up in a room and there's just a screen playing and I realized that person on the screen is not even live. It is just a recording. And I have a feeling it's, I would probably yeah. leave and be like, what the it heck am I doing a, here? Yeah, it might be a step forward from what they did last year, which last year we recorded the webinar. So mm -hmm. Beth and I co-presented. We were live with the people while they were watching our recording and interacting in the chat. So we were basically listening to our webinar. Listening to ourselves present. Yeah, because that's super comfortable. Beth and I tallied I our, our numbers story. of ums. Yeah, we, we've corrected our ums since then because we took a tally during and it was not pretty. Um, and see, um, and we had to then interact with the chat. So there was at least interaction. But if you were going to go to the trouble of doing that and recording it, whatever, why couldn't we have just presented it live? I understand they were still trying to figure out how to do all that. But like... Is this whole idea with the recording at first in case you're not able to be there? Yeah, okay. I, I yeah. And for tech glitches. And for yeah. tech glitches. Because yeah. even during my recording, I kept having Amber Alerts go off. No matter if I turn my devices off, they were still ringing through. And I'm like, y'all just going to have to edit that out. Pause recording. Right. <laughs> and they did. So when I listened yeah. to it back, I heard my Amber Alerts. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you feel like, too, we've all gotten used to tech glitches and most tech glitches tend to glitch themselves out in a minute or two and they kind of work back out more or less. Usually. No, I had my Mac crash. I had my Mac crash and I had to move over to my PC. All right, so, so there's a moment, yeah. My PC is sitting right here and I'm on you on the Mac talking to you guys. <laughs> oh no, I mean, I, we've, I, I was presenting with Sarah Gregory and she, the last 10 minutes she missed because they were having a, uh, a, oh gosh, I'm trying to, it's not an Amber alert, um, like intruder on campus with gun alert oh, where she exactly. had to go hide in the closet. And fortunately it turned out, situation turned out okay. But literally she, she private messaged me. I have to go. We're in a, a gun alert and she slowly turned the camera. So she didn't want to make any noise. And I was like, okay, we're going to keep going on. Mm -hmm. So not all tech, that would have been a great moment to have it recorded because I was like, fortunately we were most of the way through our slides, but yeah, it is interesting. It's just another interesting thing to think about as we start to pull these together. And I think like anything else, you know, we all had to learn a way to do things virtually when we shift to all virtual. Now we're learning this unique hybrid experience um, that I agree with everybody that will, I think it will continue to follow us um, because there's, there's no denying there's a market for it. I, I would argue that out of the 1200 people from ATIA who did the virtual event, even if the pandemic was, let's call it done. I don't know what that means, but let's call it done. Um, and we were back to being in person. Um, I don't think an organization is gonna is going to turn away hundreds of people who wouldn't have come otherwise. Um, right. So I mean, strictly from a money point, you got to look at that and go, wait a second, these are people that might never come to my conference because they can't get travel and they're not allowed to leave their organizations or whatever it is. And I can now get them in. Uh, so I think this is, we have this. I think this is us for, for the rest of forever now. Yeah, Judy, it's cost effective, right? Um, and you do, you make tons of money. I mean, you do, do the math. If there's 1,200 people and they each paid $350, average it if they were in a group or single, that's a fair amount of money that you're pulling in um, to manage that. Yeah. And no overhead, right? It's no overhead. You just kind of pop it up there. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, I think there is a, a piece of that will, will always stay with us.
well, hopefully it promotes access if you do things like use captions and provide yeah. ASL interpretation. Yeah, if hopefully. not, it just kind of screams in your face the inaccessibility of the platform. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't remember, um, and, I, and I don't ever go to the speaker orientation. I'll be honest, I don't ever go. Um, but I'm wondering, did anybody go to the ATIA speaker orientation? I, I did, and they did not once mention captions. I sent it to the people I was presenting with, and not once were captions mentioned, period. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like I should be writing notes about this. Well, um, the other thing, the other thing, Mike. My... Yeah. Was that? Mia, I see you talking, but I don't hear you talking. I see your box. We can't hear you. Your little box. Sorry, was... sorry, sorry. There you sorry, go. Sorry, sorry. There we go. There you go. I, I was. I thought I was pressing things. I wasn't pressing things. I'm. <laughs> yeah. Tech fail. Here I am with my mask back. Okay. So another thing was, don't don't you guys remember there used to be a deaf and hard of hearing track, mm -hmm. um, and that was actually managed by our our local um, RT MC DHH. I didn't see that this this year, and I noticed that this year was most lacking of any year when it came to support, which I thought was kind of like a little sad that it's like there was much more support in past years mm -hmm. than it was just like, oh, well, now that we don't have the deaf and hard of hearing track, well, <laughs> well, I guess we'll forget about mentioning the rest of that because people who are deaf and hard of hearing, well, they really don't come to our conferences. I don't know if it's... <laughs> I mean, you know, right, Mike? Like, right. they don't exist. I mean, exactly, deaf, Mia, that doesn't exist. What are we talking deaf, about here? <laughs> right, and as Judy's, mentioned in the, as Judy's <laughs> mentioned in the chat, it's not just captions, it's alt text. It's no. all of right. those. Right, right, yeah, so font size. Font size was the one thing that they said, use our template because, but there are little pieces of their template that are, in fact, not accessible. Right. So. Yeah. Right. I don't know who I had this conversation with when I was there, um, but the use they of they did a, have a sign language interpreter. Sorry. Yeah. No. They, they, yeah. They did have the sign language interpreter in the in the virtual part. They had the sign language interpreter. They had the caption set up. They had all of those things, um, but that didn't translate over to the live event. Um, and and I said to somebody when I was there talking about the use of a template for the for the sessions, and I and I made this the statement that I don't tend to use the template um, because I'd rather make sure. I, I feel comfortable in the way I put my stuff together, knowing that I've done what I can do. Um, and so I'd rather just take a snapshot of your picture of your template and I'll cut a piece of it into the first slide and then I'll text that, just that little piece. And then I'll just run my template of whatever I want to do, which tends to be just a blank slide um, with the elements in it um, to make sure that that um, fits in what I think makes sense for a presentation, especially when there's not a whole lot of guidance given, right? Oh, Judy, we're going to have to play this recording for people so that they can hear all of our thoughts, right? If they have us back. I really love Judy back. She's really good. I'm just letting myself hang out there. Maybe, maybe not. You're, you're, you're making good trouble, Mike. That's the problem. I think you're right. And that's fine. And that's okay. I think it's, it's worth the conversation, right? I think that, um, if we want to do this and make it better, and ultimately all of these comments are to make it better, right? Kind of like what Cassie said, you give people grace and then we move forward and we make it better. Um, Cassie just said it in such a nicer way than I could. Um, <laughs> but this idea of, you know, we saw what we did, we saw how it went, and now what can we do to change that for the next time and, and continue on that that course? Because um, I think we agree, none of these are, none of these experiences are going away. We're going to see these as we move forward. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. I saw that idea in the chat on um, the presenter feedback. I don't know that they ever ask for that, do they? Again, I should know these things, I feel like, but I don't. No? I don't remember getting a separate, like, tell us how we did as a presenter thing. Um, no. Yeah, unfortunately, Douglas, I think you're right. Very few places do. Yeah. Um, and so we do ask, they ask for the participant. I've always kind of slid mine in someplace on the, the, the general participants, or if I'm really feeling feisty, I send a direct email. Exactly. When I, when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling extra salty, I put it in my participant evaluation. 
um, I drop it in there. Anywhere you give me a box that I can type into, I tend to type things from both the participant and the presenter perspective. Um, I think it'd be really interesting. It would be really interesting to have kind of a um, um, kind of a wrap up conversation if they could make this happen. I think this would be really hard, but with the people who presented the live stream sessions and the moderators in a group and ask questions. And I'd be curious to hear um, feedback from that. And it might not be as large a group as you think, because I think a lot of the stream session were also a lot of the people who are moderators too. So I think that group is not nearly as large as we think it might be. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear what people thought about how that went. Because um, I got to imagine that there were other presenters that went back and reflected like, ooh, that was interesting. And I wish I would have done more of this and less of that. And it would be nice to capture that somewhere. Um, and I don't know that we do. Yeah, I don't think they want, uh, uh, I'm, I don't know who wrote that <laughs> in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. You did, okay, <laughs> I didn't see who wrote it. I don't think they want a vent session either. Um, but God, you gotta, you gotta be honest. A vent session makes things better, doesn't it? Because it lets people get that out and you and you move forward from that. Um, and I think people could be, I, I would argue at times here, we're having a vent session right now. Um, but I think we're doing it in a positive way. Uh, I think you can vent and still be positive. And I think you can still point out things that you didn't feel worked optimally and you want to see them get better, right? I think that's what we're talking about. But a survey would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting, right? To have that. I think it's really good. Oh, wow. We killed a whole hour talking about this. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> hey, we have seven minutes. Anything else you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah, Judy, I think they would be open. I, I think. I see J Judy saying that she thinks ATIA would be open. I think they would. Ultimately, they want their conference to be better and they want people to um, enjoy the participation and find the value in it. And so I think that in that sense, they, they would certainly be open because um, I don't think anything we've said so far is is a is a slam at the conference. I don't think anything no, is. None of it was like how how horrible these, you know, whatever no. are. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question, Judy, was for you to tell us how Maker Day went. That's I did pop thing. over for a little bit, but I didn't get to be there for very long. OK, I'm unmuting. I look god awful, and that's why I'm not on the camera. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just shot to you know what. Um, so so I thought Maker Day was fantastic. And um, it wasn't as big. And it wasn't as organized. If any of you have ever worked with Therese Wilcombe, she's adorable. And she's so enthusiastic, but it is hard to um, what is it uh, from uh, Sound of Music? How do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? So um, but what was uh, incredibly exciting this year is um, the, the youth presence, even though th they've always been there before, there was less emphasis on making and more emphasis on, um, on communicating and sharing information. Um, because sometimes uh, Maker Day, and Maker Day has always been fantastic, and we really missed uh, um, uh, Bill's presence, but we wanted to avoid the trick-or-treating that sometimes happens where people rush through, they grab everything, stick it in their bag, and there's never any kind of um, knowledge of whether they're applying that when they get home. So there were opportunities to use some of the tools, and it was very low-key, but I think uh, we also invited people that we noticed in the program were doing something that pertained to Maker that maybe would not have gotten um, invited before just because there wasn't an awareness of these presence necessarily um, in the conference program beforehand. And I thought that that was very effective. And we've got a lot of plans to, to make that bigger, um, a bigger presence next year where, you know, it, it might be another opportunity, especially for speakers that... Um, that are shy. Um, we had somebody new um, this year that brought a really novel kind of uh, maker activity, but uh, enough. I'm enthusiastic because I'm, I'm a, a low tech maker, um, but I'd love to hear what other people thought and what they would like to see in Maker Day next year. Thanks, Judy. What would you like to see in Maker Day next year? Would they have, I, I don't know, this might go again. I don't know. 
Never mind. You're having a thought. That was a thought. We actually want to have a thought I'll stop, in real I'll time. Stop. It's not like a happened. moment. So no, the only I, it thing, was a, it's a thought I needed to not think. Not so. Oh, the only thing that I would have loved to have seen, I, I know the products of 3D printing was there, but I think having the actual 3D printer there, which Judy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I did not see it, I think helps connect for them how, not simple, but like how not overwhelming that process is, even if it was just we're printing some generic key guards and we have it running. Um, I think that that's, I mean, we had them last year and the previous years. Um, so yeah, thank you, Mia. I, word finding not happening today. Um, just less scary mm -hmm. um, to be like, here's this thing. It looks like, a, it looks like it's kind of crazy, but like, it's just a printer. So I think that's the only thing that even though it was very geared low tech, which I think is really important for people to see the no tech portion of maker and how quickly um, how quickly it can happen. Um, and the Penn team did a great job. I heard at their presentation that the Penn students, which are ironically enough from Indiana and not from Pennsylvania, um, but they did a great job presenting as high school students. Um, but I, I think that there's, there's, there's power in just them seeing it, not that it was like a big take thing, but like that they could see that in action. I totally agree, and I think that's a superior idea. I don't know whether anybody saw the, the GRIP group from Florida, but mm -hmm. most of their work was 3D printed. Mm -hmm. And for someone They're to my see- They're peoples. They're right up the road. <laughs> yeah. So for someone to see how the 3D printer worked would be fabulous. And we actually had a couple of poster presenters that presented on 3D printing, but they were unable to participate in the Maker Day or send their poster over. Um, but one of the points, again, with, with, uh, with the Maker Day this year was for people to be exposed to those tools. So we had tables where people were using um, PVC cutters and wire strippers and things like that to desensitize them so they didn't go home with something that had been pre uh, created for them and not have the knowledge. And so I think seeing the 3D printer and having 3D pens and some of those other things that weren't included this year would be a fabulous addition. I think so too. That sounds really good. I like that idea. That's great. And I saw you had Scout there with his, with his fan and his balloons. Well, and that was my point with, he was someone that probably never would have thought to do this. He's just self-deprecating. Yeah. And so we reached out, I reached out to him after the, um, the maker or the, the maker round table and asked him whether, cause he was presenting there, whether he would consider coming to maker day. And I reached out to another gentleman who happened to be presenting during maker day. And so he couldn't, but you know, some of these newbies that have great things to share, but they're just not sure they're, that they're good enough. And so that was very valuable, I think for, for Scout and for the people that saw that great fan balloon thing that was awesome. really incredible. Yeah, it is awesome. But I think you're right, Judy. I think that it brings up a point that I always think about for, for presentations and things like that offering some kind of level of participation as a presenter without having to commit to an hour, which for some people feels too much. But if you said to me, I could group your presentation under a heading and you would only be responsible for 15 to 20 minutes, I think you'd get a lot more participation. Um, it's like, it's the power of poster sessions too. If you go to the posters, I mean, that is, that is the idea of a poster session is it's, it's kind of a, um, it's an entry point potentially um, for people who maybe can engage you excitedly for 15 or 20 minutes about a topic easily, but would really stretch and really would not be interested in talking for a whole hour. And so I feel that there is some power to that. I don't know how you and there was that. also power in the networking that um, mm -hmm. some of the makers were able to do about um, uh, reaching out to different groups and agencies. And Janice Reese did a, a, an mm -hmm. outstanding, I can't remember her co-speaker presentation on um, all the different resources, how they were just, you know, they were scroungers, thrift stores and all that kind of stuff. But they reached out to the Qantas Club and they reached out to this and that and the other thing. But then they also presented resources for the national um, networks so that people could get involved bigger than just, you know, their own little school district or their own little state if they wanted to. So that was a nice way of getting those resources out there. Yeah, it is a nice way, right? All, all these alternate paths for people to be able to share the amazing stuff they're doing, which I think is great. Well, thanks, Judy. We'll keep thinking of ways to uh, 
add things into it. So everybody keep that in your thinking hat and uh, send those over to Judy if you think of them or bring them to the town hall and we'll share them in another in another week. All right, guys, it's 101 according to my clock. I don't know where you are. So it's something 01 wherever you are. Um, any last thoughts before we go? Back to our amazing Monday. I haven't shoveled in like an hour and a half. Maybe I'll go shovel something. <laughs> I feel like I'll go shovel some snow. All right, guys, if not, Jen, get back out on the driveway and start shoveling. <laughs> everybody else, we'll see you next week. Have a great rest of the week, everybody.